Morning, everybody. Yeah, we, we're going to have to do a little bit of on-the-fly rescheduling because the last session was uh, very generous with the timings, but I've been told that's OK. Um, so the first of our um, speakers is Johan Heilbronn, who is going to be joining us, I've been told, um, via the electronic link, via, I think it's Zoom that we're using. Um, is Johan ready? Yeah, he's there. Wonderful. Um, and how are you feeling, Johan? Are you feeling any better? Yes, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? You can? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I feel OK, but uh, it, with great regret, of course, that I cannot uh, be there in person. Um, but as a tribute to uh, Joop Goudsblom, this conference is an appropriate occasion to try and formulate a few very provisional thoughts on the long-term development of the social and human sciences. That is on the development of the disciplines that we practice on a daily basis, uh, but that are also, that can also be part of the, our objects of study. And here is a difference between um, the natural sciences and the social sciences. There is no physics of physics or mathematics of mathematics, but there is certainly is a social science of social science. Um, studying the social sciences, the um, issues about their long-term development are, are a very complex issue, obviously, also because it's a very under understudied aspect of the social and human sciences. But as a starting point, I think we can identify a few uh, relatively uh, simple uh, principles. Um, first, the object of study then uh, can be defined as that part of the intellectual production that deals with the social world uh, and that uh, has a certain specificity in relation to knowledge about the physical universe. So central questions pertain to the conceptualization of this particular domain, uh, its assumptions, uh, cent its central concepts, its boundaries, and the like. Secondly, it is necessary to explicitly consider the, its epistemological dimensions, uh, which intellectual historians tend to leave to philosophers. But one cannot understand these concepts and methods and intellectual languages as historians define them without taking their epistemological status into account and specifying their relations to other regions of knowledge. Furthermore, third point, it is essential to go beyond merely intellectual history uh, that is to include the, in the analysis, not just ideas, but the specific groups and networks of scholars involved and the social conditions under which they actually do their work. Sociologizing these questions is roughly a twofold task. Um, pertaining to the particular group of scholars and the institutions they, they form on the one hand, and simultaneously assessing their position within the broader context, and in particular, what uh, Bourdieu has called the field of power, that is the relations of these scholarly groups, intellectual groups, to other elites, um, religious, military, economic, etc. Now, a very provisional, um, approximation of the long-term development of the, these uh, social and human sciences can be obtained by exploring the configuration, uh, by exploring the uh, classifications of knowledge. Uh, this allows to sort of account and explore the configuration of the social and human sciences, not from a few canonized names and uh, classical books, but by following the categorization of this particular body of knowledge over time and across different societies, 
and by inquiring into its position within the broader range of scholarly activity. In a very uh, summary way, uh, we can thus distinguish the most salient tendencies that seem to have structured the long-term development. There is little doubt that the first uh, discourses on human communities with a certain degree of explicitness, coherence, transmissibility were religious doctrines produced by priests and other religious specialists. Uh, in the 15 minutes I have, I have no time to give you the references, but this is a reference to uh, the process that Joop Houtsblom analyzed in uh, his uh, writings on the rise of organized uh, religion. With the growth of agrarian societies and the emergence of cities and subsequent social differentiation, groups of specialized intellectuals appeared using technologies such as writing, uh, engendering a process of rationalization of the vocabularies and representations of collective life. After this initial stage, which is very extensive in time and space, it seems to me that at least two other major processes have to be distinguished. They overlap in time and they are intertwined, but represent distinct uh, dynamics. A long and varied process of secularization and a far more recent and therefore shorter period process of scientification. Now, the secularization of discourses on the social world came about in a twofold social dynamics, a transformation in the balance of power between ecclesiastical and secular elites, and the emergence of more or less secular uh, intellectual strata, which to varying degrees depended more on political groups and state structures than on ecclesiastical institutions. Now, the best known example of this process, which has been taught to us as pioneering and even miraculous, is the emergence of philosophy in ancient Greek cities. It produced conceptions more imminent than transcendent, not only of the cosmos, but of the human world as well. In Aristotle's classification of knowledge, moral philosophy, as he calls it, is a specific branch of philosophy. It has the status of practical knowledge, distinct from theoretical and contemplative thought, guided by prudence, oriented towards action, and structured in three distinct branches, uh, politics, ethics, and economics. If one had to condense the long-term European development, one might say that this category of moral philosophy with its tripartite structure was the predominant framework in Western countries for many, many centuries. In a Christianized form, it was instituted in medieval universities. It was incorporated in the Studia Humanitatis of the Renaissance humanists. And it was this overarching conception of moral philosophy that was redefined, rediscussed, uh, renewed by various uh, groups in the 17th and 18th centuries. In order to trace such a long and to understand uh, such a long process, the attention should shift from singular individuals to frameworks of thought, their codifications and their forms of institutionalization, and thus examine and focus rather on treatises, textbooks, encyclopedias, rather than on the well-known uh, canonical individual works. Uh, two hypotheses can be formulated about this process of this long process of secularization. 
secularizing discourses about the social world developed with the formation of institutions and groups, networks, related to new structures of government. That is with the shifting balance of power from ecclesiastical towards more secular elites and the emergence of Can you still hear me? I'm not quite sure if you can still. Uh, I see you and I hear you. Okay. <laughs> well, then maybe you can mute your microphone because, uh, okay. Uh, all right. Um, so two, two, uh, two hypotheses about the secularizing uh, process. Uh, secularizing uh, discourses about the social world develop with the formation of institutions related to new structures of government, shifting balance of power from ecclesiastical towards more secular elites, and the emergence of intellectual strata, which depended primarily on political structures. And thus, various arts of government developed, that is knowledge about governing souls and bodies and peoples and populations. Sociologically, the diversification of these secular or secularizing discourses is a function of the social configuration of the knowledge producers and their evolving relations to other elites. So that would be a first general uh, hypothesis. These discourses, secondly, tend to have the status of practical and normative knowledge. They are subjected to external functions and inferior to knowledge classified as, at least in the European tradition, classified as theoretical or contemplative. They are conceived of not as applied knowledge, but as knowledge of a different order. In the European tradition as practical philosophy, a notion that of course needs to be compared uh, to analogous uh, conceptions in other societies and civilizations. The core of the European process of secularization is the long-term development of this notion of moral philosophy and its subdivisions as practical philosophy, a process that ranges from Greco-Roman antiquity to different forms of early modern state knowledge, cameralism, political economy, statistics, and so forth, uh, which includes a variety of political, civic, and juridical genres of writing. Mirrors of the Princes, for example, Republican writings, uh, natural law, uh, etc. Studies on these uh, episodes in general are not lacking, quite to the contrary. In fact, there's a huge uh, intellectual history about most of these uh, authors, and, uh, but they these studies have great difficulty in identifying more general patterns, and they tend to ignore the social dynamics that allows to explain continuity as well as change. So here again, we would need a research program that should essentially include three components, a long-term view, a comparative dimension to break away from Eurocentric accounts that very much uh, dominate the literature. And thirdly, a soci properly sociological approach to the issue. This brings me to my last point. I hope I have some more minutes left. Um, scientification is a specific and a later stage. Now, what may seem obvious to conceive knowledge of human societies as a scientific enterprise is in fact not at all 
uh, self-evident. And this then is perhaps uh, the critical or one of the more most critical questions for a long-term view on the social and human sciences. How is it that knowledge about the human condition, uh, which since antiquity in the European context was defined as practical and instrumental, came to be redefined and reclassified as science in its own right, that is as a theoretical empirical enterprise distinct from the arts of government and from purely descriptive or exclusively rational approaches such as natural law and aspiring to a status analogous to that of the sciences of the physical world. The first condition for this process of scientification was the transformation of the sciences themselves. That is the process that is traditionally designated as the scientific revolution. And we can indeed observe a tendency in the field of moral philosophy that emerges in the 17th century and that is reinforced in the 18th century in the enlightenment, which consists of taking the natural sciences, the new natural sciences and their institutions, the academies and journals that have emerged in the 17th century as an alternative intellectual model in breaking away not only from the scholastic and humanist traditions, but with the very status of practical philosophy. Traces of this new ambition can be found in individual works, in Hobbes, for example, and in programmatic statements that aim at founding sciences that are then start to be called political, civic, moral sciences by relying in various ways on the natural sciences. Understanding this process of scientification implies examining in more detail the way in which the aspiring sciences obtain their place in classifications of knowledge and in analyzing how this is translated into institutional projects. Created in the revolutionary period at the very end of the 18th century and replacing the uh, academies and other institutions um, of the old regime, the Institut de France, the National French Institute, with its separate class for the moral and political sciences, as they are called, is in all likelihood the first realization of an official academic institution for the entire range of the social and human sciences. A, an, a, a hypothesis that could guide the, the work on the scientification of practical philosophy, not to stick to the European vocabulary, uh, would be that of a second scientific revolution. The notion has problems, but as, an, as a guiding idea, I think it has some use. This second scientific revolution is an, was an encompassing transformation, historically situated between 1750 and 1850, roughly, and it can be defined by three related features. The first is the expansion and differentiation of the scientific field that occurred in this period with the constitution, for example, of chemistry, of the life sciences, of biology, uh, and of the social sciences as sciences in the newer sense of the term, alongside the more established, already established mathematical and physical sciences. Second feature is the formation of a henceforth disciplinary regime in which general and unitary categories the older notions of philosophy, for example, or of reason and nature are in decline. There is a disciplinarization of some of these notions. So philosophy becomes a university discipline. And the appearance of new and relatively general uh, categories along those of the physical universe, notions of life and living organisms, for example, 
and also notions of societies and social relations. Third feature, the transformation of higher education by the upgrading of theoretical empirical sciences, which in a sense gain intellectual primacy over the professional disciplines of the former higher faculties, theology, law, and medicine. Integration of teaching and research within the same disciplinary units, and this is the Humboldt idea of universities, and the bifurcation of the university structures into a more scientific pole and a professional pole. Now, this new institutional uh, structure was quite different from the institutions of the old regime, both from the medieval universities and from the uh, academies as they arose in the Renaissance. I, I cannot say any more about the 19th and 20th century except that precisely from a long-term perspective, we are still very much in this phase of scientification, which is defined by the fact that scientificity uh, of the social and human sciences remains a primary issue, uh, as is illustrated by multiple and recurrent debates and uh, conflicts. Uh, between an, an ever-growing number of disciplines and groups of disciplines. Thank you very much. So I lost my capacity to be a kind of officious chair there because there was <laughs> no direct fruit. Um, we maybe have time for very, one very quick question. The pressure is on for a quick question. Um, so in conceiving, so I applaud your comment about making, uh, you know, reaching out for more non-Western perspectives. Um, is there a way, and usually that's, we take where we are and we take the European perspective and then we like add the other perspectives on. Would you also think that it, it, we could reframe our history Right? So when you're discussing the history of these processes, you reach to Greece for an example of this tripartite division of uh, politics, ethics, and economics. But you could also reach back to uh, South, South Asia and to the Vedas, where their division, it was a fourfold division, but it was also a specialization. You had your political or warrior class, you had your um, a, you know, a religious or temple class, and then you had your merchants. But you could also, I could also think of other examples. Um, so is, is there a way that we can also, uh, when talking about different intellectual traditions, yeah, just reframe our history and how we talk about the evolution of these processes? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. That is a very important question. Um, I've, I, in the talk, I tried to make sense of the European uh, development mostly. I indicated a few general uh, questions and perspectives, but I was focused on the European uh, development, trying to make sense of that, which is already uh, not not so easy. But of course, yeah, I I entirely agree that we this has to be. Uh, these issues of a long-term development have to be broadened and have to include many other uh, parts of the world. And um, there is very little about that, but there is some work, of course. I mean, uh, Randall Collins wrote his, philosophy, his sociology of philosophies uh, from a both a long-term and a comparative perspective. Uh, also from a, a consistently sociological perspective. So that is a, a great example uh, that might also be uh, used for uh, inquiring into the social and human sciences. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Daniel Klembot who's going to be talking to us about how strange we humans are. Um.
title we've heard before. Feels strange. Um, yes, uh, we can always extend this through lunch, but as Brecht said, erst kommt das Essen, dann kommt die Moral, and we probably don't want to do that. Um, I did not know Johann Gutzblum very well, but I did meet him several times at Elias conferences, and I enjoyed talking to him. Like Jop, I was very interested in long-term development of humanity, and I found his book on fire, how fire changed humanity, very illuminating. In short, I am very glad to join in honoring Jop Gut Gutzblum. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, humans are very strange creatures. How did the universe create something that can get a, gain a pretty good understanding of the universe? Humans' understanding of how the universe works is very incomplete, but it is sufficient to fundamentally change our relation to the non-human world and to ourselves. Human cultural adaptation is much faster than genetic adaptation. The creation of the anthroposphere came in three broad stages, as we've heard, hunter-gatherers and agriculture. And in the last two centuries, humanity has entered a third phase, which I will somewhat arbitrarily call the industrial scientific age. This age is as different from what went before as the agricultural age is to what went before it. GDP and GDP per capita began to grow at an unprecedented rate, first in Britain and then spreading from there. Obviously, there is no exact date for the beginning of this new age, but it is worth noting that Adam Smith had no notion of it when he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, while Marx and Engels considered this new age well established when they published the Communist Manifesto in 1848. David Christian has already told us how humanity has changed in the last two centuries and how the rate of change has accelerated. The result of these changes has been vast, a vast improvement in human life and at the same time an enormous increase in the dangers to humanity. I want to discuss one aspect of, mo of modern scientific society, science. The rise of modern science was a necessary but not sufficient condition for the creation of the ever-changing modern world. To understand how humans got to their present stage of development, we have to understand the emergence and development of modern science. I will briefly discuss how modern science came into being in the 17th century, how it works, why it works, and where this leaves us. In my discussion of how and when modern science emerged, I will rely heavily on the works of H. Flores Cohen, How Modern Science Came Into the World and the Rise of Modern Science Explained. I urge everybody who's interested in the subject to read those books, especially the, how, uh, the shorter one. Uh, Cohen argues modern science first emerged in the, scientific, uh, in the scientific revolution. The emergence of modern science can be understood as neither inevitable nor purely accidental. And that's, Elias actually says the same thing. Um, modern science did not come from nowhere. It developed from earlier thinking about nature. Cohen calls this earlier phase nature knowledge. I will call it proto-science. Cohen says that proto-science developed in three places, Athens, Alexandria, and China. Proto-science developed twice in the ancient Greek world, in Athens and in Alexandria. The two styles of proto-science were quite different and did not interact much. Meanwhile, in Athens, there were four incompatible schools of proto-science arguing rather futilely with one another. These schools were sufficiently different so as to make their explanations of the natural world totally incommensurable. For a time, proto-science in Athens and Alexandria made many discoveries about nature, but by 150 BCE, they had petered out. The creative period of ancient science was largely over. Greek proto-science enjoyed several pe periods of revival and new flowering. Scientific knowledge was revived and extended from time to time, but after flowering for a while, lost momentum. Before the rise of modern scientific industrial society, science wasn't very important. Progress was episodic and limited. 
Science has been essential to the modern world since about 1820. Before then, science was merely interesting. It could easily lose funding or come into conflict with religious authorities and peter out. The scientific revolution of the 17th century changed the pattern. In the beginning of the century, science flowered. Kepler refi refined the Copernican model. Galileo used math and experiment to show how gravity works. Descartes combined algebra and geometry. Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood and much, much more. In spite of these advances, Cohen believed science might have petered out as it did in Italy after Galileo. What saved science and led to the creation of modern science was the ideology associated with Francis Bacon and the establishment of a successful paradigm for physics by Newton. Though there were many other scientists, though of course there were many other scientists involved, the new science was most closely associated with these two figures. In other words, it, it's not a matter of two people, but that's how people thought of it. In Galileo's time, his mathematical physics still had to contend with Aristotelians. Galileo and the Aristotelians spoke mutually unintelligible languages. By 1700, Aristotelian physics had disappeared and physics, uh, uh, physics operated within a Newtonian paradigm as it has ever since. Bacon is important because he convinced society that science could be used to improve human life. Science was not particularly useful in the 17th and most of the 18th century, but it was we well established and ready to be harnessed in the 19th. Newton's great success in physics led others to want to revolutionize other sciences. It took time. Chemistry developed a useful paradigm at the end of the 18th century, while various aspects of biology and medicine only developed in the 19th. As each new science developed, it had to develop new methods. Each science has its own method. <laughs> to be sure, these scientific methods have common features, but they differ in detail, and obviously the people who work in them need to learn the details. Scientific knowledge is produced by humans. It is a social process embedded in wider social processes. Let me illustrate how a science works. I will use mathematics, a slightly odd choice since math has no empirical input. In math, new truths are discovered all the time. How? Mathematicians individually or collaboratively work on solutions to problems. Though mathematical truth is largely the product of individual, individuals, mathematics is very much a social process. Mathematicians are paid by universities and other institutions. Some have more prestige than others. Mathematicians are trained by professors of math. Math findings are published in journals. Some of these journals are more prestigious than others. I could go on. How is the truth of a mathematical discovery established? It is certified by the mathematical community. At the end of the last century, Andrew Wiles solved Fermat's last theorem, a problem which had been around for centuries. It was published, and some errors were found in his proof. With the help of a former student, Wiles fixed the proof. The story is not simply of an individual genius's success, though it is that. Wiles' first proof was flawed. This means that a proof is not a proof until the mathematical community accepts it is. Mathematical truth is what the mathematical establishment says is true. A theorem is not a theorem until it is certified by reputable mathematicians. You become a reputable mathematician by doing good mathematics. You are admitted to the informal set of reputable mathematicians by other reputable mathematicians. The set of reputable mathematicians is self-perpetuating. This shows uh, that there is a high degree of autonomy in math. Mathematicians learn what a proof is by submitting to the authority of an established mathematician. There is no explicit set of rules that defines a valid proof. Mathema mathematicians and members of other scientific communities submit to the authority of establishment figures. This is a feature, not a bug. Other sciences work similarly. Senior scientists form a kind of establishment the established determine what is funded and what results are accepted. Results that do not conform to the accepted science are ignored. As Michael Polanyi asserts, 
only the discipline imposed by an effective scientific opinion can prevent adulteration of science by cranks and dabblers. To be sure, disciplines outside of sci natural science work the same way, but not exactly. In, say, economics, there is no single standard that defines accepted knowledge. When Einstein modified Newton, it did not result in a Newtonian and an Einsteinian school of physics. When Keynes modified classical economics, this did not lead to a synthesis, but to two opposing schools. In this sense, economics is still a proto-science. Uh, this leaves a major question. Why does it work? It consistently increases human understanding of the natural world and human control over it. Science is a human social activity. So is religion. Science has multiplied human power over nature. Religion hasn't. Uh, science is universal. You learn the same physics in Beijing as in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, religion obviously isn't. Um, Relig um, philosophy also has not, um, is not universal in that sense and has not led to any major changes in the way people live. Scientific industrial society is not much more than 200 years old. In that time, it has unified humanity to a greater degree than ever before. It has changed the human condition and will continue to change it in the foreseeable and unforeseeable ways. Humans have always suffered various ills. Humans lived largely locally or as empires developed regionally. Wars and genocides affected different people at different times. Since World War II, this has changed. Humans have become capable of making all of humanity prosperous and of destroying all or nearly all of humanity. Atomic wars, global climate change, misuse of AI, genetic engineering of humans, may lead to catastrophe for humans. At the same time, humans are capable of creating ever more prosperous populations. Humans have liberated themselves from many of the constraints of nature. Humanity is, a strange, is strange and in is a, a strange juncture. Elias dedicated his life to creating a science that would make humans less dangerous to one another. I think he believed himself at the beginning of a long process. It's not clear how much time humanity has. David Christian's optimistic future does not seem so appealing to me. If the meaning of human history is to create AI robots to supply us, isn't that the end of humanity? If we're lucky, they'll keep a few of us around as pets. <laughs> Fantastically on time as well. Great. Um, <laughs> well, I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, some questions. Any questions? Yeah, Nick. Well, that, well it's a, a quite basic question, of course. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about the relationship between the so-called scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. Now, you said the, the, the scientific industrial era starts about 18... 20, but before you said also there, there was the, the scientific revolution of the, of the 17th century. So there is an, uh, an obvious relation between it. Could you, could you okay. be, be yeah. more what specific I, uh, about that? Bas basically, it looks the scientific revolution actually took place uh, before the Industrial Revolution and then was integrated into the Industrial Revolution largely in the 19th century. In other words, and, but the other part of that is without the, scientific, without the science, the Industrial Revolution would itself have petered out, would have been another efflorescence. There was one in the Song Dynasty in China, for example, but the, it is the science that then intera interacting with technology that, that kept it going. But Bacon, who sold the idea that science would be useful, was premature. It didn't actually. He sold it, and that meant that science kept going. It, it helped to, keep, uh, to uh, fund it, but it, it didn't really start happening for more than a century. And again, it's a complicated question because uh, what and the steam engine is influenced by science? Not really much, but, you know, it, again, it, those, there's an endless 
uh, discussion of those things. Thank you for uh, your, your um, talk about the sociology of science. Can you also say a few words about evidence-based science? Uh, well, in other words, one of the things that made, that created the scientific revolution was much more, uh, um, much closer attention to evidence and a much clearer idea of what an experiment was. In other, uh, in other words, what it, the, once science started getting established, the, um, the interaction between uh, experiment, observation, evidence, and so on, and theories became much, uh, much closer. And a kind of, it, it, it involves also a kind of skepticism. I mean, for example, if you read, read Lucretius on atomism, he will tell you, he has all these wonderful theories about things, and he believes he's answered the questions. Actually, the same thing is, is true of Aristotle. All these ancient Greeks were terribly optimistic that they'd answered the question, whereas the scientific attitude is we have some answers which, relate, which create new questions. We can't do a final answer. I mean, there's no final answer. And, there's, and you always have to question to some degree. I think the whole falsification thing of Popper is overdone, but there is an element of that in, in, in really all science. In other words, one question you, you always have to ask yourself is, uh, what would convince you you're wrong about something? Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. OK, so we are going to run over time, folks. Um, if you do need to leave early, I understand that. Um, but we'll be pushing probably 10, 20 minutes into the lunch break. I hope that's OK. All right, so we now have, and I've never been able to say your name, so I'm, apologies if I get this wrong, but I think it's Yeri Shubrat or something. I'm probably, probably profoundly wrong. Um, who's going to be talking to us about how the future isn't what it used to be and how the idea of the future has changed in the long-term process of the development of human knowledge. Yeri. Yes, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I greet you from Prague. Uh, in the book uh, About Time, Norbert uh, Elias examines uh, time from the perspective of uh, the sociology of knowledge. Johann Hautzblom uh, was inspired by Elias when he divided uh, the historical development of uh, time determination in four phases. Uh, the first, there was no tool for measuring time. Uh, second, uh, devices uh, that measured time in units of unequal length uh, were used. Three, uh, there has been an expansion and standardization of uh, time measuring devices and the introduction of units of equal length. And four, effort to synchronize time measurements have resulted in the creation of a worldwide uh, system of uh, 24 time zones. Uh, another approach is offered by Otayne Ramstedt, who talks about four historical uh, understanding of time. The first, occasional awareness of time uh, founded on uh, distinguishing uh, now and not now. Second, uh, cyclical awareness of time containing the distinction before, after. Uh, three, linear awareness of time, i.e. past, present, future, with a closed future. And four, linear awareness of time with an open future. In my contribution, I will build on these inspirations, but focus only on uh, the issue of changing ideas about the future. Uh, Mircea Eliade in the book, The Myth of Eternal Return, attempts to reconstruct the way of thinking of the people in ancient society 
showing that their opinion on the passage of historical time was connected with the idea of a kind of eternal cycle of uh, repetitive circular returns. Uh, thus, it has uh, metaphorically been uh, said uh, uh, about ancient humanity that they could not see uh, the future because they moved backwards from it with their heads turned to the past. The transition uh, from uh, paganism to Christianity brought a significant change in the structure, in the ideas of time among uh, European peoples. Christianity uh, 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 attached uh, importance uh, to the past associated uh, with the events uh, spoken in uh, scripture and uh, the future uh, associated with the expectation of the last judgment. Uh, this straightened time and it uh, uh, acquired a linear uh, vector character. Uh, the life of medieval men thus unfolded uh, simultaneously uh, according to two time plans, the plan of locally limited uh, transi uh, transient daily life and the plan uh, determining uh, the fate of the world, times of proclamation, salvation and damnation. According to Romano Guardini, the medieval form of the world began to disintegrate during the 14th century. This process uh, continued in the 15th and 16th century, then assumed a definite uh, attitude in the 17th century. In this, uh, the process, the world grew and broke its con uh, contours, uh, revealing uh, that uh, one could go further in all directions. Baroque culture was fascinated by the phenomenon of infinity in its uh, special and temporal significance. In historical consciousness, this uh, reinforces the idea of transition through history between an ever deeper past and increasingly distant future. However, it must be added that the future as a dimension of historical time had to be invented. Greek and Roman uh, antiquity did not understand the term future in the sense assigned to it by uh, the Middle Ages or the Modern Age. The Latin word futurum was an empty term, uh, something like a blank page. The idea of the future as a better word or as something that obliges us to work for it was a foreign concept to ancient humanity. As mentioned, the Judeo-Christian tradition is associated with a certain notion of the end of the world and history. It has a distinctive eschatological character. From the uh, Renaissance, secularization tendencies began to show themselves. These gained the upper hand in the Enlightenment, which replaced the perspective of salvation with the idea of progress. In the 19th century, uh, one uh, of uh, the outcomes of uh, these tendencies was Marxism, in which eschatological expectations of the end of history took the form of classless uh, society. The eschatological orientation on the future is associated with the idea of certain finale, a certain end of history, which concepts uh, that have a common uh, denominator a closed future. 
This is not only because historical development is heading towards a certain end, but above all, uh, because the direction of history is considered as a given one of for all in a contemporary language pre-programmed. Uh, differences in this concept are found in whether it is assumed that the great finale can be passively awaited or whether it is necessary somehow to work for it, either in scientific way as in August Comte or by a revolutionary struggle as in Karl Marx. Utopian works have had uh, considerable importance for the development of this kind of thinking, beginning to emergence during the uh, Renaissance. Uh, utopias uh, reflect the values and the views of those living at time belonging to sphere of the imagination of the future and uh, they uh, document contemporary notions of the limits and possibilities of social dynamics. In the second half of 19th century, the idea of history had a, a direction and sense uh, greatly expanded. Uh, it was a period dominated by what is known as historicism. In the minds of the people of that time, the horizons of the past and future had a different shape and depth. The past had a, a different significance, still being seen as a teacher of life. It had, according to opinion at uh, the time, a development law, which the further development of humanity would follow. Uh, there was a very vivid uh, belief in progress in great emancipative stories heralding happy tomorrows. Uh, later, however, decadent moods of fantasy echo spread in which the fate of humankind was associated with the idea of decline and ruin. Uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century, however, a new, a different idea was formed, uh, connected with an open future. If for a religious thinking, the past and future were bounded by the beginning and the end, then now it was as if a distant abyss appeared in both uh, directions. In the spiritual atmosphere of Darwin's theory of evolution, the idea of an open future emerged uh, with uh, no uh, predetermined scenario, no outcome set in advance. Uh, 100 years later, Postmodern culture, having learned from the great traumas and of the 20th century, uh, was characterized by fundamental distrust and skepticism uh, toward great narratives about the past and also the future. It is quite logical that along with the loss of faith in great narratives about the past, at the same time, faith in the future largely disappeared. It is generally considered that presentism is uh, symptomatic of, uh, of the postmodern age, the focus on the present. On the periphery, a radical predicament can be found in the punk subculture under the slogan, no future. The collapse of uh, Soviet Union at its satellites in the uh, late uh, 1980s and early 1990s contributed to uh, the spread of present day attitudes. The atmosphere of this period is reflected in uh, Francis Fukuyama with his book, The End of History and the Last Man in which the end of history was associated 
with the statement that after the victory of democratic liberal capitalism in the former communist countries, the world could expect nothing more than the further spread of this established social model. At the beginning of the new millennium, however, Shmuel Noah Eisenstadt challenged this idea with his concept of multiple modernities pivoting to the image of history with an open character. Uh, sometimes uh, one encountered the saying that the faster you go, the further you need to see, which is of course a matter of fact in driving cars. If we transfer this consideration to the current dynamics of social development, uh, this implies a need uh, to anticipate, uh, forecast, and plan. In the 20th century, therefore, disciplines uh, based uh, 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 this, uh, uh, disciplines uh, developed with terms such uh, as uh, forecasting and uh, futurology, whose goal, uh, goal became based on a knowledge of past and present. To estimate uh, development trends uh, leading to the future state of affairs. Advanced methods were adopted uh, to this end, some uh, of uh, them applied from the sciences, such as uh, mathematical modeling, while other methods were invented specifically for forecasting, as was the case of uh, the Delphi method. The uh, discovery of development trends led to the uh, formation of uh, mostly optimistic ideas represented, for example, by uh, John uh, Naisbitt in his work dealing with megatrends. However, from the late 60s, developmental optimism was tempered by warning uh, forecast, uh, exemplified in the early 70s by the first report of Club of Rome, in which uh, Dennis and Donella Meadows and their uh, collaborators use a JW Forrester model to formulate an alarming prediction of catastrophe with global dimension. A classic work of uh, that time was American futurologist Elwin Toffler's Future Shock, where the onset of new technical ch uh, changes represented a loading test of human adaptive capabilities. The scientific community for many decades has shared the idea that any science to be recognized as a science must be able to predict the future states of phenomena. In the 19th century, proponents of Determinism claims that if uh, they knew what the universe looked like uh, at its beginning and the laws that governed it, they would be able to predict everything in the future. Uh, Karl Raimund Popper criticized this deterministic thinking in the social sciences in the mid 20th century, showing that an essential part of any society is the knowledge of its people that they uh, are familiar with. Their knowledge and technology. The fun uh, fundamental problem is that we don't know and cannot know what uh, knowledge people will have uh, at their disposal in 20, 50 or 100 years and therefore we cannot predict with uh, sufficient comprehensiveness and certainty what societies will look and how they will develop. Against determinism, uh, other types of thinking have developed, like the theory of chaos, the concept of butterfly effect, the idea of radical uncertainty or collapse. 
Uh, let us add, uh, however, that the uh, adoption of uh, an open future does not uh, relieve us of the task of uh, trying to think out its uh, future states. One of the key reasons for doing uh, this is what Ulrich Beck calls uh, emancipatory catastrophism, whose task is not to create a purposeless atmosphere of uh, fear of future catastrophe, but above all uh, to find a potential for overcoming contemporary problems to make this world a better place for uh, the life of its inhabitants. Thank you for attention. Thank you so much. Really interesting presentation. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Hi, so you mentioned chaos theory and this idea that if you knew what was uh, exactly at the Big Bang, you could predict the future, which I find very interesting about chaos theory, which relates to your comments about a closed future. Um, but there's this other idea, complexity theory, um, which is essentially unpredictable, which most uh, mathematicians would say would describe human social um, systems because, because there are inputs to the system. It's not a closed system, so therefore it's unpredictable. Um, so there's also research that says that experts are very bad predictors of the future, right? In some cases, it's the lay people who are better predictors. Um, so, can, I mean, can you comment on this? Like, is the future, um, when we think about the future as experts, how much hope do we have to, to say something useful about it? <laughs> so to answer this question, maybe it's not a question, it is maybe a remark. Uh, it is a very uh, complex uh, problem. I think uh, when we speak about limitations of our prediction, uh, a very good illustration we uh, have in uh, the futurologist literature from the past decade. Uh, when we read this literature, we can see uh, what happened, the previous futurologists predict and what uh, not. I think uh, that uh, the picture of uh, our world today in uh, this uh, early uh, futurology uh, literature is uh, different from, uh, from, our, uh, from our world. Uh, and uh, what about theory of chaos? I am not an expert in this uh, theory. I know it especially from uh, literature uh, like uh, the book of Ilya Prigozhin and others. Uh, I think that in theory chaos we can read uh, that uh, uh, we uh, are now in some point and this point open not only one way how to follow uh, to the future but uh, there are uh, opened uh, many ways, many branches for next uh, development. And uh, how uh, uh, it will be in the future, uh, it is a result of uh, many uh, uh, factors of uh, aspects, I think that uh, it is uh, very good illustrated now in uh, the war in Ukraine because uh, we are in this situation in which we don't know uh, what will be our future in five days, in ten, ten days, how it will be in half year. I can make a prediction that um, imminently we're all going to go and be eating something for lunch, but <laughs> just before then, <laughs> Um, uh, if I may just squeeze one last question. Um, 
I, I went to a British Sociological Association conference last year, virtually, which was about futures. And uh, I came away feeling a little bit depressed because nobody was really talking about futures. There was one group of scholars who were talking really about social reproduction. So the idea that even to discuss having a future was a kind of privilege um, of people who had other possibilities ahead of them. But for those in subjugated positions, no such possibilities would, would ever be manifest. So it's actually a kind of very depressing, bleak view that. And yet that was strangely alloyed with a similar idea that activism should be at the heart of sociology and that we should be all involved in bringing about different futures. So these two things are sort of Janus faced. And it's, it's really, to what extent does Elias's concept of possible futures help us to get round that kind of problem? Okay, I, I think that this, uh, it was a very clever note and I can uh, agree with all of what you, what you said. Okay, <laughs> okay. All right. all right, thanks very much. Yeah.